Good morning. It is so good to be with you all. It is so good to be in God's house. My name is Dr. Brian. I am the theologian in residence. It's been a minute since I've been able to share with y'all, so it's good to be up here with you. Uh, let's go ahead and start off with a word of prayer, and we'll jump in, continuing our conversation around why church. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for the meeting places where we touch you, where we see you, where we are reminded that you are with us in the laughter, the tears, the touches of those who you've given to be with us in this space and in our virtual spaces today. Be with us as we reflect upon you and your word Help us to draw, help draw us into a deeper understanding of how we can be and become your body and your people. In Jesus' name and through your spirit, we pray these things. Amen. So why church? We are continuing this series. We're thinking a little bit about the idea of the structures today. So not just the people, not just the, the doctrine, but what does it mean to be in a space together? And... I imagine I don't necessarily have to go into too much detail about the value of being together, because I, while I wasn't quite sure what it was going to be like in the midst of the pandemic, now that we're kind of starting to emerge it, I see it in my classrooms, I see it in this space, that we know that there's something about being together that is different. Maybe not better, maybe not worse, but different. Something that we need, something that, like that vitamin, like you wake up one day and you're just like, I really, really need an avocado, and you don't know why. But your body is telling you that there's a nutrient, there's something that it needs, right? And there's something about gathering together. And so what is it about this space? What is it about a church? What is it about our life together that's important? And so why church? This question I get every single time I teach Intro to Theology, whether it was with undergrads, even with seminarians who are getting ready to, to presumably go into the pastorate. They're like, why the church? Why do I have to deal with all of these people? Why do I have to deal with all of these legacies? You know, why can't it, like, why can't I just, you know, I have five friends. We all believe. Why can't we just call that church? You might be asking yourself that question right now. Because, in fact, this morning, you could be riding your bike with a local club. Why do all bike clubs ride on Sunday mornings? <laughs> you could be at ecstatic dance. You could be sleeping and resting in. You could be cooking bacon, a little bit of toast, slicing up avocado. Okay, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe some people, that's a better idea. I won't see anyone here next week. And of course, this is all before we even get to the realities of the trauma, the pain, the small and the large gashes, the pricks that are inflict inflicted in spaces like where we were supposed to be meeting God. So why church indeed? Feels like there's more reasons to not be here than there are to be here. Why are we here? What is this place? What is this space for? So to think about this, I want us to go back to Exodus again. We've been kind of pinging around, but I love this idea of Exodus as a book for thinking about what does it mean to be church, because what it means to be church is really what it means to gather. What does it mean to be a people? And Exodus is this reminder of, what, of who Israel is supposed to be after long, long periods of exile and trauma and pain. And they need a reminder. This is who you were made to be. This is what life together means. So this is the word of God. Exodus chapter 39, verses 32 through 43. In this way, all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished. The Israelites had done everything just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Then they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent and all its utensils, its hooks, its frames, 
its bars, its pillars, its bases, the covering of tanned ram skins, and the covering of fine leather, and the curtain for the screen, the Ark of the Covenant with its poles and the mercy seat, the table with all its utensils and the bread of the presence, the pure lampstand with its lamps set on it and all its utensils, and the oil for the light, the golden altar, the anointing oil and the fragrant incense, and the screen for the entrance of the tent, the bronze altar and its grating of bronze, its poles and all its utensils, the basin with its stand, the hangings of the court, its pillars, its bases, and the screen for the gate of the court, its cords and its pegs, and all the utensils for the service of the tabernacle, for the tent of meeting, the finely worked vestments for ministering in the holy place, the sacred vestments for the priest Aaron, and the vestments of his sons to serve as priests. The Israelites had done all the work just as the Lord had commanded Moses. And when Moses saw that they had done all the work just as the Lord had commanded, he blessed them. The word of God for the people of God. So maybe not your typical verse for thinking about why church, but we'll talk a little bit about it, why this verse is important. But first, what is a gathering? If we want to be fancy about it, uh, this idea of church is, is this word ecclesia, which simply means gathering. Um, and sometimes in, in Roman times, gathering could be anything. It could be a social club. It could be a bread club. It could be a shield club. I don't know what the Romans did, but what the clubs were. But it was a gathering, a voluntary social society. And this is true for us, right? Sometimes we gather because we enjoy each other. We weren't made to be alone. We're all real clear about that now. We are communal creatures. Sometimes we gather for protection. You see it in, I've seen all the post-apocalyptic movies, shows. I know what you do, right? If the zombie apocalypse comes, you find the five strongest dudes you can <laughs> and hold on for dear life, right? Because if you're, all, if you're by yourself, you die. I've seen enough of these, I know, right? So you, whether it's like Walking Dead, The Last of Us, right? Enclaves of people. The more, the more people you have, the safer you are. We gather for protection. So we're, gonna, we're not going to survive by ourselves. Sometimes we gather around shared loves or interests. Maybe Last of Us chat rooms or watch parties. Cycling clubs, knitting collectives. We gather around passions or care for issues of justice and mercy. You volunteer with a group of folks every Saturday at the bridge. Or you weed and plant along Burke Gilman Trail on Tuesday mornings. We gather because we find connection in something we love and something that we're passionate about. But Israel is a different kind of gathering, though. They are a people literally made by God. Their life and their rhythms are a reflection of that creation, the means of participation. They're not a club or a collective for mutual protection or for family. When God calls Abram and Sarai, they had a people. They were good. They were straight. There was a time when Israel did not exist. But God said, I want my name to be known in all of creation. And so I am going to make a people out of these little grains of sand, breathe into them my promises, my spirit, my love, and they will not be who they are without me. And I will not be who I am without them. They are a gathering whose existence is not for protection, not for likes and dislikes, not even for the cause of justice. They are a gathering that reflect and participate in God's life as an invitation for all of the rest of creation to participate in God's life. 
So the answer to the question, why church will always be insufficient if we are comparing it to social clubs or government organizations or community orgs or mutual aid spaces, whether for good or for ill, those spaces exist out of a need. They are created with an end. How is a bicycle club a bicycle club if no one comes with bikes? Hey, guys, I'm wearing my khakis and my good shoes today. Do you have a bike? No. But can we all hang? That's not what we do. But church is a rhythm that extends from Israel's life, Israel's gathering, Israel's creation, a people made from flesh and bone and promise and spirit. What does it mean to be this kind of gathering in the world, especially in a world that is filled with so much uncertainty and pain? And where that pain seems to be inflicted and aided and covered up by institutions and structures. And so often, when gatherings are faced with crisis and uncertainty, they can misread and misconceive what they're called to be. So returning to Israel in Exodus, in the midst of this uncertain wilderness, Moses ascends Mount Sinai, and there he receives the law. You all familiar with this, right? Um, Charlton Heston with the big tablets coming down, right? The lightning, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, right? So this is like, you're like, okay, yeah. And so often this is what we, people think religion is, this is what people think Christianity is. The ten laws etched into a stone tablet to guide the people in their new lives apart from Egyptian rule and labor. And I would imagine that for most of us, rules feel like a really easy way of shaping our communities around. Do this, don't do that. We are people who do these things. We are people who don't do those things. Oh, you do those things? You're not part of us. Rules create boundaries. Rules create shape. Rules become ways of being able to see who's in and who's out. And unfortunately, this is so often for churches what faithfulness looks like. Churches founded on stone tablets and a list of things to do or not do. And too many of our churches took these tablets as the shape of their life as a church. But the thing is that this, at the top of that mountain, God gives Moses something other than the law, in addition to the law. He gives Moses instructions on how to build the Ark of the Covenant in the Tent of Meeting, which was the passage that I read. The ark might be familiar to most of us. At the very least, we might remember that the ark, we might think of the ark as that thing that melts people's faces off in Indiana Jones. <laughs> Scared the crap out of me when I was a kid. But I don't know anything about the tent of meeting. It's like this weird artifact, right? So in addition to the law, God gives to Moses the guidelines for creating a space to meet with God, to abide and worship and remind the people that their God is near. Interesting, isn't it? That in all of our recollections, it is the law that's remembered as coming from God and not the plans for the tabernacle. Why is it that we associate meeting God more as a list of what to do and what not to do with rigid expectations that come with the threat of exile or hell if they're not followed, instead of meeting God as being home? But if I begin to recall the many stories of God's word doing something, I'm reminded that the law is never alone. The word is never without enfleshment. A tent of meeting where the divine and the creature meet and are held together in faith and adoration. Even in the very beginnings of our creation as human beings, let us make them in our image. This is a rhythm that has been singing from the very first moments of our breath together. God wants to be with us. 
And so Moses descends the mountain, tablets and plans in his hand. Israel is to receive and to build, be cultivated and to cultivate. And so as Moses comes around the last bend of the mountain road, what is it that he sees? You remember this part of the story too. He sees his people having grown impatient with Moses' absence, growing weary in their wait for the fulfillment of God's promise. They took some of the gold that they plundered from Egypt, melted it down, and formed a golden calf. Now, what I want us to think of is we sometimes think of this moment as as a kind of utter, profound defiance of God, a defilement in some ways. But in actuality, like so many things, it is the slightest misdirection of an impulse that is, in fact, what it is that God hopes for us, creation. Maybe not the thing that God had wanted them to create. Maybe not with the intent that God had wanted them to create. But this idea in the moment of wilderness, in the moment of not having anything, of not knowing where to go, we make something, is in fact part of how God creates what it is that God asks us to be. But the problem is the calf is a different kind of enfleshment a different kind of manifestation. It is the incarnation of a fearful uncertainty, a fear that begins to play with our memory. It blurs the edges of our pain so that only a mythical picture of the idyllic day remains. And so faced with miles and miles of unknowing and a seemingly absent leader who didn't even talk like them or walk like them, they began to feel backwards, trying to bring that imagined past into the present with them. They melted down the resources intended to sustain them and instead fashioned an idol upon which they hoisted all of their anger and their fear, praying that somehow this old form could resuscitate some semblance of freedom, anything that was more solid than their ill-defined current moment. I can identify with that. And we remember what happened next. Moses throws down the tablet, rebukes the people with the law of God in pieces on the floor and the plans in the folds of his, of his robes. He turns back to Sinai again to, to, to intercede for his people, receive the law again, descends, this time his face shining with the glory of God. And Moses gives the law to the people. And then he calls for offerings of gold and silver. Even that idol that was forged. Fabric and gems. And then he calls for the artisans. He calls for the craftspeople. So in the face of a people who did not believe, occupying a land that was not theirs, without knowing a time when they would be home, Moses persists with the call. The call to create. The question was not whether to create, but the question was what to create. We sometimes think that faith is an invisible feeling or an ineffable force that somehow animates us. And we have to cling to that as we walk through a world of temptations and material concerns that should somehow be behind us. But as Moses calls the artisans, probably the very same ones who had charged with forging the idols, God is saying to Israel, your faith is a creative faith. Your life with me is a present, material, felt reality. Taste and see, touch and feel, smell and sense the goodness of my life and your lives together. Yes, even in the wilderness. So in response to receiving the word, the law, the people design ornamentation, cut acacia trees, strip bark, stoke fires, soften and forge metals. They embroider, drawing thread in and out in countless times until sheep begins to form. They sand down branches until rough trees become smooth poles. And they polish and press gold into panels until plain wood draws in light and kisses it out. In the face of betrayal, an endless wandering, 
God does not ask Moses to find map makers. I personally, if we're lost, I want a map maker. I don't want a golden watch that doesn't work. Or warriors. There's some dangerous dudes out there. Can we please have someone to protect us? We don't need a, a pole for a tent. Can't kill somebody unless you sharp it. Maybe we'll sharpen the end of the stick. No, that's not for that what that's for. Or even priests to somehow pray and intercede on our behalf. No. Moses calls the artists, the makers, those who can sit and put their hands to work that seems like, seems meaningless, repetitive, boring, until their hands get chapped and, they, and they, all they smell is the, is, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the dust in their nose, even while the, oh, the wood is long gone. Those are the people God calls. Those are the people Moses wants. He wants those who can dream and imagine where there is only a blank wall, who can see a structure before it's built, and the painstaking processes and patience it takes to bring that picture into being. Biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann suggests that the cultic life of Israel is a reenactment of creation, that the worship life of Israel points again and again and again to creation itself. And this seems right to me, though perhaps less because of archaeological or literary patterns. It seems right to me because the word is never without presence in God's interaction with us. There is never law or idea or doctrine. There are only words becoming flesh, co-minglings of eternity and time that leave us with uneasy joy that we are more than what we see. And what we are is holy. So in Israel's middle place between liberation and home, in the panic and fear and exhaustion, in their terror of seeing what some will do when they sense control slipping from their fingers, Moses gives Israel the law and all the promises they hold, and then he invites all who believe to respond, to participate to worship by creating, adorning, laboring, and in their work they make visible God's life among them, a space that will travel with them in the many miles left before them, that will speak and sing even when those whose fingers bore the calluses of its creation have long since died. God invites them to be co-creators in the cultivation of God's presence with them, of their lives as people of God. In the face of the wandering, God asks them to adorn themselves, their community, and to build. And so here we are today in our own kind of middle place, some of us fearful and anxious, some of us wondering when will this ever be our home, and perhaps some hoping for a time when things were simpler, more straightforward as the world seems to shift under all of our feet. But if we're to believe in this God become flesh, perhaps we can begin to see a resemblance between God's words to Moses at the top of Mount Sinai and in the Son of God become the Son of Mary. Perhaps we can see the possibility that there is not a word of promise without also a call to create, that there is no rebuke without also a call to construct, that in the face of fear, in the face of an unknowing, in a world where home seems only like a mirage, a fanciful delusion, can we see the truth that there is no place where God is not? And God has called us to build in our lives together a tent of meeting. Spaces not of permanence, but places of beauty that can be carried with us. God has given you what you need. Look all around you and you will see the gold. You will see the silver. You'll see the swords. 
the images and the words that were used to exploit us, to steal our children and our belief, turn our labor into someone else's riches. But words and images, gold and silver, swords and shields can be melted and banged and bent to become something new. They can be reconfigured to enflesh a new world imagined at the top of a mountain. In Jesus, we are birthed within this law made flesh, a holy structure that carries us even as we image him. So what is the church? It's the gathering of those who have begun to see the embroidery of God's life in their own life, and they want to share it. It is the place where we come to offer sanded poles and forged metal. It is where we bring the gifts that had once been exploited, but are now exercises in freedom. We come and we bring ourselves. We bring our bodies. Because we are not who we are without God. And God gives us one another. This space as nourishment, as reflection, as release. To, to be breathed into again and to offer life to those who are exhausted so that we can be tents of meeting in our various corners of the world. Now, let me just say, I'm going to take a minute here to do a quick plug because this, in some ways, is, you might say like, oh, okay, it's all fine and good for you, Dr. Brian. You, you're a theologian, you're a ministry, church is your whole life. <laughs> but the truth is, especially after the, in the midst of the pandemic, I didn't want to come. The pandemic messed me up. I was in my head, I was in my body, I was curling, I was hiding, and every single morning when it was time to come to church, I had to peel myself off of the couch to be here. Not because I didn't love y'all. I love y'all. But I don't know if I could do it. And so my posture towards my life in the church was let me do the bare minimum. I'll preach. I can do that. I gotta be there then. But sometimes when I was here, I wish I was riding my bike. Sometimes I wish I was still sleeping. Sometimes I wish I was walking the dog. But the deeper I've gotten into this post-pandemic moment, more and more that I, I've come and I see you all here, and I see what this space means for you, I'm reminded of what it means for me. But I'm also at this point now where I'm realizing that for me, showing up is also not just enough. I'm like, okay, God, I'm going to show up. And for me, in that season, that was a lot. That was my Akicha pole. That was my gold and silver. But now I'm not so sure. Now I think I'm healthier. I think I'm in a space where I'm a little freer. And over the last few weeks, I've been more and more convicted that, well, God, maybe there's, maybe just showing up isn't just the thing. Maybe I need to not just sit back and wait for somebody to say, Dr. Brian, you do theology. What is it that, can you teach us a class? Maybe I need to go to Pastor Gail and say, babe, I really want to teach a class. I want to bring my skills that I have in this space, in my seminary teaching, and I want to bring it to church. These are the dates I want to do it. I want to share. So this gives me a chance to do a little plug for an intro to theology course that I'm teaching during Lent. So the last four Saturdays. And it's for everybody. You say like all theology doctrine. No, no, no. Like, well, first of all, it's me. So it's going to be fun. <laughs> but it's we, who we are and who is God. A short introduction to theology. And it's a bit, just basically a way of beginning to say, what, is, what are some of the different beliefs that constitute who God is? But what are some of the conversations around those questions? How do we answer some of the gnarly kind of questions? And so it's not these are the beliefs, it's more like these are the questions. 
And what does it mean to walk through those questions? On Holy Saturday, the day before Easter, we'll be thinking about resurrection together and life with God. So that's my Akecha poll. That's me recognizing that, yes, my body is important. God wants my body, but I'm also at a space now where I have more than that to offer. And this is the space I want to offer it. So, and this is one of the things that makes the church something different than a club or group of chosen friends that we don't get to choose. God wakes up the first creature, wakes up their eyes open, and they see this other who is like them, but it's not like them. And it's not like they put it in order to Amazon and got just what they wanted. They said, who is this? I have to share now, but God says, yes, you have to share because you're not like me if you don't have someone else to share with. What is the church? The church is the place where we come and we're reminded and we share, but we don't always get to choose who we share with. It's the place where we come and we hear and we listen, but we, always don't, we don't always get to be told what it is that we want to hear. What is the church? It's the place where we come and we gather and we're reminded that we are loved even in those moments when we may not even believe it ourselves. So the church in its many manifestations and incarnations is where we come to meet God, to share how God has met us, and discover the ways that God is inviting us to see her in the world. And so God gathers us to build tents of meeting and invites us to draw upon every gift, to craft with care and attention and adorn and decorate the place with stitch after stitch. And there's holiness in these everyday acts. But even more, Will you allow yourself to become the work? Some of you in this room must let yourself be adorned to see the abiding God who has not left you, but sees you by her side. You're beautiful, your home. Let this be your home. Stop and rest. Put a bit of yourself up on the walls, but not just for you, but also for the people you will welcome. Because to adorn your home, your body, your life with friends or walks, to say that beauty is for you is to say that God has made your body to speak and to be home, even in this wandering place. You are called to be tense of meeting. And God adorned you with the word's birth, with life, with his death, with his resurrection. In Jesus, you have been cut and shaped and knit together into a glorious temple. Now may we live as though the work is finished. Why church? Because we are beautiful when we are together. And when we are together, we discover new ways to feel how God is near. God is already here. God is already one. We are free and evil cannot win as long as we are unafraid to live as liberated people. Go in peace and let your lives become tents of meeting, adorned in love and presence of a God who desires all of us to be free and to be free with one another. Amen.